Well, welcome everybody to another of HydroTerra's webinars. Today we're joined by John Hunt from Ventia, who's a bit of an industry legend. And uh, he's going to talk to us about PFAS remediation, the role of ESD, sustainable practices, practicability and proportionality. And many thanks to Ventia for giving John the time to present today. Before we get into things, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. There's a picture of John Hunt wearing a suit, looking very smart. A little bit about John. So John has a PhD and is a senior technical advisor in Ventia's Contaminated Site Remediation Group. He worked for Ventia and its predecessor, T Services, and associated companies from 2000 to 2021, taking a mentoring role at GHD after retiring from Ventia. But he's now back at Ventia, I'm happy to say, and uh, some of the work he's presenting here today was done with GHD. So it's a little bit of input from GHD there as well. So thank you to them too. Before joining the environmental industry, he was a coal research geologist at the CSIRO, and that's where he did his PhD, um, and oil and gas exploration geologist with Delhi Petroleum and SO Australia Limited. In the remediation field, he started with GTA in the 90s, doing in situ and ex situ remediation of total recoverable hydrocarbons and other contaminants in soil and groundwater. He then worked for ADI, which is Australian Defence Industries, on remediation of several former defence munition manufacturing sites before moving to T-Services for the Rhodes Peninsula Dioxin Remediation Tender. During his career in site remediation, he became interested in sustainability and has been a member of the Sustainable Remediation Forum of Australia and New Zealand since its formation in the mid 2000s. He is a past president of Australian Land and Groundwater Association, ZALGA. We love your questions and I'm sure John would love to get lots of questions today as well. To raise a question, use the Q&A button at the top of your screen, and I will read those questions out once John has finished his presentation. We have a lot of people here today. Um, third largest number of registrants in uh, behind Susie Reichman and Mark Stuckey, but a great audience. So well done, and that shifts Phil Mulvey to fourth position, if Phil, you're here. Why does HydroTerra run these? Well, we like to share knowledge, we like to facilitate education, and we like to hear from industry leaders. So many thanks to you, John, for presenting today. Before we move on to John's presentation, um, there is a aligned, I guess, um, what do we call it? Symposium, I guess, aligned to this topic that we're talking about today that ALGA's running next week. And uh, recommend that uh, as many of you who can should attend that. So that one's PFAS Management into the Future 2024 Symposium uh, in UTS Sydney on the 14th of March. I've got over 150 delegates attending there. So please get in touch with ALGA uh, if you want to learn more about PFAS. All right, John, I'd like to pass over to you now and thanks very much for presenting. Thanks for the introduction, Richard, uh, and thanks very much for uh, putting these seminars on. It's good to see companies uh, giving back to the industry, so to speak. 
and I'd like to um, thank Ventia for uh, supporting me to be here and uh, GHD where I uh, learned all about PFAS. Uh, next slide. Just for the record, I tried to avoid PFAS in my career. I figured someone else needed to um, keep doing the other stuff. But when I joined GHD, I was thrown into the PFAS washing machine and I came out uh, knowing a bit more about PFAS, but not too much more about remediation. It seems to me that remediation of PFAS uses the, um, the same methods and strategies that we've used for most other contaminants, and we're still waiting for the um, silver bullet to um, turn up. So my agenda today is uh, basically a third, a third, a third. I'm going to speak on ecologically sustainable development or ESD uh, using some notes that David Tully put together for Surf ANZ. I'm then going to speak on sustainable remediation using some notes that Tony Scott put together for Surf ANZ. And then I'm going to speak on a hypothetical PFAS remediation case study that I put together for GHD for the workshop next week. Um, and the key words uh, through all of this will be practicability and proportionality. There's a lot of nomenclature in ESD, sustainable remediation, um, and the regulations that we deal with state to state. And it's good to know where it comes from and have a stab at uh, what it might mean. Next one. So sustainable development uh, all started with the Brundtland report um, in Belgium. Um, you can see the definition there. The date's 1987. I was in the museum in Antwerp a few years ago and there's half a floor of, um, actually devoted to the Brundtland report and sustainability. So there you go. I haven't seen that in Australia yet. Next one. So following the Brundtland report, uh, Australian put together a national strategy for ESD, um, which was endorsed by the Council of Australian Governments in December 92. And it was then up to the states to implement ESD in their regulation and legislation and as you can, as you will see, as we go through the language in the in ESD actually keeps appearing in our regulations as they're updated, possibly with a different focus uh, from time to time. But basically, that's where it's coming from. So it's good to understand. Uh, next one. Uh, all of the state-based contaminated land legislation, in fact, includes objects to promote the principles of ESD. Um, for instance, uh, in the ASC NEPM 2013. Next one. And um, I wouldn't be surprised uh, now that uh, there's a sustainable remediation standard out, an Australian standard, that um, auditors and EPAs start to ask for, um, you know, formal uh, sustainability analyses when you're doing your wraps uh, going forward. I know that's already happening in some states and with some auditors, and I expect it uh, would become more uh, prevalent in the future. So some of the key words and concepts. Sustainable development meets the needs to the present without compromising the needs of the future. ESD has six principles, and I've listed them all there, and you will recognise some of them. Uh, sustainable use has the word has words like prudent, rational, wise, and appropriate. Uh, how you measure those things, of course, is a bit of a, a, a difficult task. Uh, integration talks about integrating environmental, economic, and social considerations, and that's straight into um, the standard for sustainable remediation. The precautionary principle, um, and I actually stated the precautionary principle there in the orange highlighting, and there's lots of different ways of saying it, but in the precautionary principle, it says that a zero risk standard is inappropriate, and it talks about proportionality. Um, that is the effort to address a risk should be uh, proportional to the um, nature of the risk. Uh, and you'll find that language keeps coming back into regulations and most uh, recently, I think, into the Victorian um, regulation. 
the remaining three principles uh, you'll be aware of as well, but they're not really what I'm focusing on. If anyone wants to get a practical feel for how ESD is, uh, is applied in the law, uh, Justice um, Brian J. Preston, Chief Judge of the Land Environment Court in New South Wales, has made a career of selecting cases to illustrate the application um, of the principles of ESD. And it makes for very interesting reading. That title there, which um, Stephanie Martin at GHD found, was actually a talk he gave recently at a seminar on PFAS um, in um, Queensland, I think it was to do with PFAS replacement. Next one. So keywords in the guidelines, precautionary principle, cost-effective, risk-based decisions, sustainability, and um, in the intergovernment agreement on PFAS contamination, it talks about financially and logistically sustainable. So financially is a fair consideration. Proportionate to risk, so there's our proportionality. Um, and managing risks in a way that's financially and logistically feasible. Next one. Uh, in regulations, and I think this is from the Victorian regulation, we find this CUSFARP or SFARP, if you're working on defence sites, clean up so far as reasonably practicable. I looked up reasonable and, reasonable and practicable in the dictionary, and that's what I found in the first two um, cases. Once again, things that are or certainly reasonable, uh, difficult to measure. Um, but in the regulation, they talk about proportionate controls, so eliminate engineering administrative, which speaks directly to remediation options. And the greater the risk, the greater the controls, which is another expression of proportionality. Next one. Just before we do so, SASFARP on the trend sites, what's SASFARP? Uh, it's just uh, the CU is missing, SFARP, so far as reasonably practicable. Thanks. So this is the section on um, sustainable remediation. We have a sustainable remediation forum of Australia and New Zealand, and um, this material here is um, taken from the website. If you want to look in more detail, you can go to the website and find these talks. Uh, its mission statement is the development and pr promotion of sustainable practices and thinking for application to contaminated land and groundwater projects. Next one. Um, we now have uh, a, a soil quality and sustainable remediation standard, AS ISO 18504. Uh, sorry, that should be 2022. Um, the idea of sustainability in terms of the three considerations, social, environmental and economic, is shown in the Venn diagram on the right, which is a handy way of thinking about it. Next one. Uh, in terms of the background, the um, ISO came out in 2017 and Paul Nathaniel, who many of you will have come across at conferences here, was, um, I think, the chair of that committee and whipped it through the process. Um, it was adopted as a British standard in 2017. It went on the um, Australian standard to-do list, but they forgot about it, so it didn't happen until 2022. And as I noted before, it's probably fair game now for EPAs and auditors to ask for your SR analysis in, in a wrap, given that we have a standard. And what I'm doing today is basically just demonstrating a very simple application of the standard to uh, PFAS remediation. There's what's covered in the, uh, in the standard. It's only 23 pages. It's simple, readable, usable, and flexible. And it's an informative, not a normative standard. So it doesn't... Um, tell you what to do it tells you how to do it next one uh, the basic definition of sustainable remediation is elimination and control of unacceptable risks in a safe and timely manner while optimizing environmental social and economic value of the work so it's it's about risk and risk management it's not actually about this method or that method or this chemistry or that device so it refers to dem demonstrably breaking the source pathway receptor linkages, and that can be done 
using very simple methods like capping and cap and contain all the way to very complex methods like thermal treatment, which is always uh, site and place, uh, place and time specific. Um, and the thought at the bottom is mine, sustainable remediation is time and place specific. And to figure that out, think about what you can do on a country site versus what you can do on a city site when it comes to remediation, simply because of land value. It's about the outcome of comparing feasible options right now. And it's not about taking a solution and greening it, so to speak, substituting solar energy for diesel generation or something like that. It's about holistically thinking about problems. Next one. Uh, basically, it allows for the process to be done simply where that's the appropriate thing to do or if you have um, complicated projects and the solutions are, are very similar, then you may need to go to a much more complicated analysis of sustainability. But as a general rule, you do the simplest form that you can that's appropriate for the for the pro, uh, for the problem being thought about. Uh, next one. Uh, the process uh, outlined in the standard you'll all be familiar with, framing the project, identifying the options, assessing the options, selecting the preferred strategy, and then developing the plan. Next one. And the key, the key principles when you're making decisions in a sustainability um, context for remediation are to identify legal requirements. So you, if a sustainable solution is outside what's legally allowed, then it's not sustainable by definition under the standard. Uh, so you can't have any unacceptable risks as defined by law to human health and the environment and no unacceptable risks to workers or nearby communities. And decision making should be transparent, of course, and good governments would always uh, mean that there's significant or appropriate stakeholder involvement. Now, the nomenclature which I need to talk about is dimensions, indicators and metrics. The dimensions you're familiar with, economic, social, environment, indicators are characteristics that represent a sustainability effect that can be compared across options. So something like ton kilometres if you've got movements on road or CO2E if you've got emissions. Uh, metrics are the, the way you uh, measure the indicator. Uh, it can be dollars a metre cubed for a financial dimension, for instance, tonne kilometres for, for social impacts via truck movements on road, CO2E, risk reduction, noise in decibels, and so on and so forth. Uh, next one. Some things, of course, are difficult or hard to measure or can't be measured because they're very subjective. Um, and some social and environmental values fall into that category. So you end up doing sustainability analysis with some things that can be measured and some that are difficult to measure. Uh, the guideline has lots of metrics. These are the ones I'm looking at today for my little hypothetical. I'm looking at direct cost. If we knew the direct cost for all the remediation options that we consider, we'd be streets ahead, but usually we don't because it's a bit opaque, actually. You know, you've, you've got to have the tools and the experience to work out the direct costs. Um, I'm also looking at uh, CO2 emissions. So in remediation, we dig stuff up, we transport it around, we run it through, through treatment plants, we move it again, we put it back in the ground, we bring in backfill. They all have emissions associated with them, and that's a, a good way, a good thing that's fairly, I find fairly easy to calculate and compare. My social, um, my social indicator was disturbance by trucks on roads, not trucks off roads, and I measured that in ton kilometres. So I just figured out how many tons went how many kilometres for my various options. And uh, the final one was uh, risk reduction, which I measured by looking at how much of the contaminant was destroyed or immobilized. They are having different risk footprints, of course. Next one. Uh, at the end of the day, the sustainable remediation standard is more or less a checklist. And I, I think that most of us, in fact, have been using elements of the checklist when we do our assessments, but the standard basically gives you a systematic way of going about it and believe it or not when you do it systematically you will discover new things and get new insights 
that you might not have had previously. So I guess in retrospect, most remediation options assessments do arrive at more or less sustainable outcomes. But if you want to get the sustainable remediation award from ALGA at the then you need to go through this checklist up front about how sustainable it was. Actually put this or the auditor asks, it'll be there. Next one. You broke up a little bit during that slide, John. I'm not sure if you want Oh, okay. Um, yeah, do this up front. Uh, if you want the sustainable remediation award from ALGA, you can't do it after the fact. Uh, and if you do it up front and the auditor or the EPA asks for it, there it will be. Thanks. So our hypothetical site is an airfield that's been using a lot of um, AFFF historically for fire training. It's an alluvial soil. I've got some quantities of soil and some concentrations of PFAS um, that you can work out the soil mass and the PFAS mass. The bar graphs on the right show soil mass in red and PFAS mass, uh, sorry, so PFAS mass is in red, uh, it's in grams and soil mass is in blue and it's in tons. And I had to, um, the funny scaling is because I've got them both on the same diagram, of course. But you can see the typical pattern that, that I've seen throughout my career for most contaminants is there's a small amount of matrix with a large amount of contamination and then a relatively large amount of matrix with a small amount of contamination. And what I've done is I have worked up uh, a remediation strategy where I'm treating all of that PFAS right down to the lower levels. And then I'm going to have a look at proportionality at the end. The cross section shows a typical sort of PFAS distribution on a site. It's only in the, the, the PFAS is in the top two metres. The hotspot is fairly shallow. It's in fact from half a metre to one metre. And surprise, surprise, it's deleted. It's depleted in the upper half metre because we've got a lot of mass flux into surface water. So the objective of a hypothetical is to uh, basically reduce the mass flux to surface water as much as we can. Um, and um, I'm going to do that in this case by excavating and either treating and reusing or treating and destroying. Uh, I'm assuming that the risks is risk is proportional to the mass, and that's a very simple assumption. Obviously, given the way the, the contamination is layered, you could get into all sorts of debates and come up with much cleverer models, but that's my simple assumption. Next one. So in terms of the process, uh, we determine human health and environmental risks. And in this case, we've decided there due to the, the mass of contaminant present, compare with acceptable levels, determine the required concentration, mass or mass flux reduction, remediate and then monitor. Uh, in this hypothetical, some of the hotspots are quite hot and do represent a risk to um, human health, uh, but uh, only in small areas. But the main driver is environmental risk, of course, because of the mass flux into surface water. We have off-site um, aquatic ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems that have to be protected. Um, there's, the, there's our breakdown of PFAS mass and, and soil mass again. And you can see that the greater than 50 milligrams a kilogram, which is in a very small amount of soil, contains 30% of the mass. And you can read down the table there and immediately remediation options will start popping into your mind. Next one. Just before you do, so this mass flux reduction, do you do a baseline flux estimation first and then... Yeah, all of, all of these sites would have fairly, um, I'm going to say, long-winded assessments occurring and monitoring of surface water mass flux. The hypothetical, the main risk pathway is mass flux into surface water. And given it at the end, we're not going to remediate everything. Monitoring post remediation is very important to demonstrate just how much the mass flux was reduced by. Um, Professor, Professor Ilka Wallace, I think at Flinders Uni has a very nicely calibrated model that can actually look at mass flux from hotspots or from PFAS in soil. 
and probably model before and after mass fluxes. But at the end of the day, monitoring needs to be done. You probably hadn't thought about that, Richard. <laughs> Next one. So um, just for the record, of course, uh, we're going to try and remove as much PFAS as we can. But at the end of the day, there are practical considerations. If you are going to excavate, you probably can't excavate closer than X to the um, Another 10% of the mass is in the very low level class, which for the hypothetical I'm mediating, but at the end of the day, you probably won't remove that when you apply proportionality to the exercise. Um, and of course, uh, so yeah, the cut might be removing 90% of the mass, but it could actually be significant less than less than that even without being does and that's why you need to monitor this one john i think you better go have i lost you you're frozen uh you did you did get very unclear there maybe try that slide okay again. um considering um we want to remove mass there are some practical limitations at the end of the day on most sites you will be leaving pfas around services that you can't approach uh, with excavators and that could be around 10%. And if you leave the low-level halo, that could be another 10% of the mass. So despite your best endeavours to remove as much as you can, there will be practical limitations even on sites where you excavate. Next one. Uh, what's in the halo is of interest to me. Um, my hypothetical, I think, has 10% of the mass in the halo. These cumulative graphs of uh, PFAS and soil from a 3D model suggest that there could be a lot more mass in the halo. Um, personally, I, I'm not sure that I believe them because 3D models tend to overestimate what's in the um, halo around hotspots, particularly as you move into higher confidence uh, intervals if you're doing uh, uncertainty analysis on the results. And these graphs here are for a 70% confidence interval uh, of a 3D model. I simply raise it because it is difficult to actually estimate how much mass is in the halo. Um, next one. The options I looked at, um, the first three options, manage, cap and contain, and encapsulation um, aren't being done in my hypothetical because we can excavate and because the site owner doesn't want to have to manage the PFAS on site. So the options that I've costed are immobilise and reuse, immobilise and dispose to landfill. So in the hypothetical, this state will let you take PFAS to landfill, but it has to be immobilised to meet uh, leachability criteria. And the third one is um, thermal treatment and reuse. Uh, and the only facilities that, that do that at the moment uh, are in Victoria. So I'm traveling a thousand kilometers by road for thermal treatment. I'm traveling a hundred kilometers by truck for disposal. And there you can see my plant on site doing some um, immobilization. I think that's actually EPS's plant just to give EPS a plug. Next one. When I did my metrics, I, um, I costed up those five options. Um, I costed up five options. One was to immobilize and reuse everything except for material over 50 kilograms and 50 milligrams a kilogram. That always went to thermal treatment because under the NEPM, you can't, or sorry, the NEMP, you can't actually reuse that on site. Uh, the second option was, um, Immobilise and dispose all. Now, we all know that's silly because it's going to cost an arm and a leg, but I put it in just so we could see that. The third one was to thermally treat all. Uh, and we all know that's silly too because we're not going to take the whole lot down to Victoria and that's going to cost more than an arm and a leg. But I put it in just so you could see that. And four and five, immobilise and reuse combinations, immobilise and dispose and thermal treatment, 
and five is immobilize and reuse and thermal treatment without immobilize and dispose. So those are the five options I costed up in my uh, hypothetical. You can see the results below. Total cost, thermal treatment, which is in the middle, is obviously not practicable, not financially practicable. Um, and immobilization and disposal is also quite expensive if you do it for everything. Options one, four, and five, however, have similar costs. So in the sustainability analysis, those are the ones you'll be focusing on and trying to discriminate between them. The two charts to the right just show rates per cubic meter or per tonne, and they basically follow the same pattern. And finally, rate per kilogram of PFAS um, treated, which also follows the same pattern. Remembering that we didn't treat all the PFAS because we left some around the services and maybe we left the halo. Next one. Uh, the second thing that's easy to consider are the, um, the metrics around risk, which can be an environmental or a social metric. And you can check those out in the bar graph to the right. Th thermal treatment obviously destroys all. Um, every one of them has the 50, greater than 50 milligrams per kilogram destroyed by thermal, which is the green bit at the top. And then the rest of the risk, you'd see the going to landfill, which removes the risk from the site, but transfers it to the landfill perhaps, or reusing on site, which then brings in management and administration because these things tend to get lost with time where they are and what we should or shouldn't do. And that's a very important risk management consideration. The older I get, the more important it becomes. Next one. Uh, for social metrics, I did off-road tonne kilometres, on-road tonne kilometres and rail tonne kilometres. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the answer. You've got to go to the um, symposium next week if you want to see that, but you can probably guess what it is. Uh, the the off-site road has the highest impact, of course, because it's affecting communities. Next one. Uh, another environmental metric, CO2E, I'm not telling you the answer either. You've got to go to the symposium to see that. Uh, in general, however, earthworks don't contribute a lot to CO2E. Transport doesn't consider a lot to uh, contribute a lot to CO2E. Um, immobilization, well, if you want to find out how much that contributes, you better do some surfing, no pun intended, on the web. And of course, we all know that thermal treatment has very high CO2Es and therefore must not be sustainable. Uh, I'm joking, of course, because thermal treatment can and uh, it can be and is sustainable in the right circumstances, like treating that greater than 50 that by law you can't do anything with except for treat and destroy. Next one. So in considering our practicability, um, the regulation would say the greater the risk, the greater the controls. And what we'd, what I'm what I'm going to do in my solution is I'm going to uh, destroy the highest risk material, so the greater than 50 milligrams a kilogram. And this site actually had up to I think 200 milligrams a kilogram on it. Uh, the site my hypothetical is based on. So there are some pretty high levels out there. When I started, I was told one milligram per kilogram was a high number for PFAS. The 20 to 50 milligrams per kilogram, you can destroy it, you can landfill it, or you could reuse it on site. I haven't found anyone who wants to immobilise and reuse simply because of the risk of managing it. The 1 to 20 could be immobilised and reused, and often is, and the 0 0.1 to 1 can also be immobilised and reused or just simply managed without any treatment. Um, so practicability and proportionality, how do they apply? Let's have a look at the next slide. Uh, in terms of the options I considered, um, immobilise and reuse all the risk, the management risk is um, too high, the ongoing management, and that's not reasonably practicable. Immobilise and dispose all, that's not practical simply because of the cost and the social impacts. And thermal treatment of all isn't practicable simply because of the cost. What is reasonably practicable is immobilisation and reuse, immobilisation and disposal and thermal treatment in some sort of combination. Now, thinking about proportionate, of course, we have 
10% of the PFAS mass in the halo, but it accounts for 40% of the cost if you treat everything in the hypothetical. And that's where I'd be doing that sort of analysis of mass distributions to figure out what is proportionate. It's really a value for money thing. How much risk, um, you know, what's the cost benefit for reducing risk? And in this hypothetical, we can reduce 90% of the risk by spending 60% of the money. And to get the extra 10% of the risk, we'd have to spend another 40%. So that's how I would see proportionality applying. Next one. Does the reduction um, actually really equate to the risk though? So. Uh, well, that's a good question, and we could spend many, uh, many minutes, uh, many hours, days even talking about that. I made the very clever simplifying assumption that it did early in my hypothetical. So for my hypothetical, it does. You're asking, is it a case in reality? And I mentioned looking at the cross-section, uh, particularly given that there's depletion in the upper half metre, there still is flux coming from the lower from the next half metre down in back into the upper half metre, of course. And you could develop a much more complicated rationale uh, in your remediation options assessment and then do your sustainability analysis on that. My hypothetical, fortunately, is very simple. <laughs> so so, so in, I can... Um, in less hypothetical sort of situations, do you still approach, still apply that sort of logic or do you go have to go to a more complex... Well, you can go to a more complex remediation um, proposal and then assess it, uh, and you're doing the sustainability analysis will be more complicated. You might have to do models and calculations, you know, of flux rates and things like that. Um, I'm just trying to keep it simple to demonstrate how it can be done um, in a simple case, and then it's up to everyone to go off and apply it to their more complicated cases would, would be my answer. <laughs> no worries. Often doing a very simple analysis will put you right into the right ballpark. Uh, uh, you know, you can, you can get rid of the, um, the things that obviously aren't going to fly or maybe they obviously weren't going to fly or weren't ob it wasn't obvious they, they wouldn't fly. But you can use it to eliminate options and then you've got to do a much more detailed analysis of the the two or three that remain. Makes sense. So in conclusion, uh, thinking about PFAS and risk and risk management, you uh, in sites where you can actually do something as opposed to sites where you can't, and some sites you can't, you've got a cap or cap and contain, that sort of thing. But if you can do something, you start from the top down because the risk uh, in this model, and I think in reality, is associated with the mass. Um, and eventually, at some stage, you will run out of money or technology or something. But you start at the top. Uh, in terms of proportionate, of course, you look at the mass, the risk, and the cost. And uh, for this model here, we had an inflection around one milligram a kilogram. So we we actually ended up treating everything above one milligram a kilogram and leaving the halo in place to be managed. Um, once again, that's very site specific because I was looking at a site the other day that where the concentrations range from about 10 down to 0 0.1. And it came, it actually remediated down to about 0 0.1. Maybe they, I think they went below 0 0.1. So that, that'll always be site specific. Um, in terms of the important learnings from all of this, I always go back to understand the problem. If you don't understand the problem, you're not going to develop the right solution. So spend more time understanding the problem, actually looking at the, you know, the site assessments in detail, doing the 3D models, doing the mass flux uh, measurements. And if you understand the prop problem properly, then you're going to develop an appropriate solution. If you don't, your engineers will go off and do a very good job of putting the wrong solution in place. <clears throat> Number two, develop sustainable remediation metrics for your solutions. Uh, and number three, um, find ways of identifying that uh, concept in ESD of proportionate action, action that's proportionate to the risks. 
So between all those three, you'll, you should come up with um, the best answer possible for the site today. It may not be the best answer 10 years down the track. Maybe the regulations will change because at the moment uh, applying the, the precautionary principle in regulation, we're, we're being very precautionary because we don't really know what the uh, effects are of PFAS uh, on the environment or human health for that matter. Um, and that's where I'll leave it. Time for questions. Thanks very much, John. All right. Early bird questions. Thanks for everyone who sent these in. Number one, how can Australia's airports work on soil remediation? Has the horse already bolted? Well, this is a pretty tricky question. In fact, I proposed a presentation with a with that has the horse already bolted in the title. <laughs> People got very nervous about talking about it. Uh, obviously, harking back to our hot cross section, uh, PFAS has been around for decades and most of these sites show depletion in the top half metre. So to some extent, the horse has bolted. But there is still a heck of a lot of mass uh, left in the ground because the, the rate of mass flux to actually get all of that PFAS out into the environment is going to take many more decades to centuries. So um, I think, yes, if you can remediate it, you should because uh, basically um, it's not out there yet, but it will be one day if you don't do something about it. Number two, is there an online real-time analysis method for PFAS in soil or do we rely on lab testing? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, no online real-time. We're relying on lab testing. It'd be nice if there was something even that would give you relative readings in the field. Well, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I saw a presentation at Battelle by a school a school kid who developed a method for shaking water in a vial and measuring the thickness of the froth, froth on top that actually gave a reasonable rough correlation of PFAS content uh, for the site they were looking at. But um, I'm not aware of any sophisticated calibrated uh, field methods, uh, but I'm not really the right person to answer that question either. Uh, I'm not aware of any either, but uh, we can do a bit of research into that one. Number three, would you recommend using bioremediation as a sustainable remediation method? If so, if so which bioremediation method do you recommend? Uh, well, I like this question because you could substitute any method for bioremediation. You could say immobilisation, you could say thermal. I think the whole point of the talk is there is no such thing as in an, an innately sustainable method. You've always got to look at the site and the context. If you have an inner city site with development pressure, bioremediation is not the sustainable method to use, even if it's just got simple TRHs on it, not the sustainable method on site. You might do it off site. Um, so, and you know, which method you would use once again, depends on the situation. If you're out in the countryside somewhere, you might like to land farm happily away because the site's got no value and no pressure. Uh, if you're um, somewhere else, if you're trying to deal with PAHs, you're going to need to do something a bit more active. So it, it's not... Sorry, is bioremediation yeah. a pretty slow process with the PFAS? Uh, well, yeah, you need time and space. Uh, and in some circumstances, you don't have time and space. So, you know, by definition, it won't be sustainable at that site. Uh, simply because of the context. It may be sustainable at other sites uh, that don't have the same constraints on them, or it may be sustainable to do it off-site. You simply go through the metrics and look at the options, or look at the options and go through the metrics. And bioremediation, it's like most, most technologies, it has a sweet spot where it's very time and cost effective, but as you run into more difficult contaminants of concern or more difficult matrices, the costs and the time will go up and eventually you'll stretch it to the point where it's no longer feasible. You know, technically it can't be done or financially it can't be done or suddenly it costs the same as doing something a lot more high tech like thermal treatment. 
So there's no sort of one answer to this. It's always in the context of, of time and place. Yeah. Would it be a challenge for regulators to work past the proprietary information on chemicals in commercial, see that word, products? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question, and even if I did, I'm not the person to answer that. Um, okay, I think I'm the same boat. Number five, the agricultural impacts of not applying biosolids to land versus continued and improved monitoring of PFAS in biosolids. I think what we're talking about there is... Uh, do does PFAS in biosolids pose a risk? And do we have a cost-effective way to monitor them? Um, I I can't really answer that one. I'm not um, not a biosolid specialist, but I think um, Matthew Askeland at ADE has spoken at great lengths about this. Um, uh, done some very good presentations at some recent PFAS uh, symposia. Uh, in fact, the one last year that's the uh, predecessor of the symposium on next week. So I would highly recommend go and talk to him or Google the stuff up and see what he had to say. Hey, how does the concept of ESD and proportionality apply to the Queensland DESI EV approach and 440ZF of the EP Act? Uh, I don't know. I didn't have time to look up 440ZF of the EP Act <laughs> before the talk. But uh, like I said, ESD was a national concept and it was up to each state to implement it. And what I reckon happens is every time the regulations, uh, every five or ten years, whatever the cycle is, every time they get uh, revamped, upgraded, um, ESD concepts come back into them, maybe in a different focus. So they all are related to ESD, and I think the regulators are all committed to um, uh, to ESD, and that's why the language keeps appearing in the regulations. All right, number seven, PFAS and vapour intrusion. Um, as I said before, uh, previously, um, Vapour intrusion isn't really a PFAS issue for, for PFAS in soil, but I am aware the, uh, of a site where I think it had an industrial process using PFAS as a blanket on something hot where the PFAS was actually in the off-gas stream coming, off the, coming out of the process. <clears throat> but that's really the, the exception rather than the rule. And then in a much larger context, I think PFAS is moving in the environment or in the atmosphere as as an aerosol and circulating quite widely. And, you know, the famous case is PFAS turning up in the polar bears in the North Pole, of course, um, possibly by atmospheric mechanisms and redeposition and then getting into the food chain. Number eight. Hi, John. What is your opinion on the National Remediation Framework documents as another tool in sustainable remedial design? Uh, yeah, the, the NRF has, um, has some documentation, basic documentation on methods, <coughs> which if you're not familiar with methods, uh, that's a good place to start. I think when it was um, finished, um, when the first version came out, we were asked where to next, and most of the methods there could be expanded on in quite some detail, so it is limited in that sense, but there are resources on the internet if you don't know about methods. Um, it does have a, a cost-benefit and sustainability analysis tool um, that I find <coughs> a bit clumsy to use, I guess. Uh, it is. It was developed uh, at the request of some of the multinationals because there was no cost-benefit guidance in Australia for big resources projects. <clears throat> and so while it can be applied to small remediation projects, um, what's in the, uh, in the ISO or the AS ISO is a lot simpler and more straightforward, I find. Okay. But if you're into CBA, go to the NRF. 
number nine. John's views on how sustainability decisions are made with disposal and thermal. In well, I have, in fact, of course, touched on that today. <laughs> if you look at the, um, I think, the analysis of risk for the different methods, thermal destroys the PFAS down to 99.9999%. Uh, having said that, the treated soil, to my knowledge, is not actually being reused in the countryside in Victoria, but it is being reused beneficially on the landfills as cover and roadways and that sort of thing. If you send it to landfill, that's a whole different issue. You've simply transferred the risk somewhere else. And in the, in the Australian context, it probably does sit with the landfills. But in the US context, of course, um, people who put stuff in landfills often find themselves um, on the wrong end of the lawsuit. <laughs> when the landfill closes or the owners disappear or whatever, uh, it's it's a risk transference thing anyway. And that depends on the value of the people who are making the remediation decisions. And, you know, they're often clients with budgets and their own view on risks that they will and won't accept and they will or won't manage. So in the US, if you're a landfill operator and you received, say, some... PFAS contaminated soil and then say you were the remediation contractor and the original site owner went bust and then there was a case against the landfill would, would the risk sit with the contractor or how does that work? Uh, in the US to my knowledge the risk seems to go back to the owners of the material that went into the landfill and possibly that's where the landfill landfills are shut and the operators no longer exist and that sort of thing. If you then have problems coming from historic dumping of chemicals in landfills, and back in the in the bad old days, it, they may not have been very well designed landfills. Of course, uh, I think it's actually the owners of the uh, the material that went in that end up on the hook, and there can be lots and lots of them. Of course. It's sort of interesting in the context of something like pesticides applied on paddocks and now we've changed our view on them. Um, something to ponder. Mm. Number 10, cite examples of where stabilised PFAS soils have been accepted and reused on sites in accordance with the NEP, NEMP, or is it meant to be NEP? Um. Well, it, it is happening, but it's um, it's always, to my knowledge, it's only happened on site, so to speak. If you immobilise soil on your site, you can reuse it on your site uh, in accordance with the NEMP. Um, I'm not aware of anywhere where someone's immobilised soil and found a home for it off the site, for instance. Um, I, I really I can't be more specific uh, than that without uh, applying to people for permission to talk about their sites. <laughs> no worries. Number 11, to what extent have the respective state regulators been engaged in development of the standard? Well, I suppose it depends which standard you're talking about. If you're talking about ESD, <coughs> then the states were, I imagine, intimately involved in the process. I, I certainly wasn't. I was around at the time, which would have been the early 90s. If you're talking about sustainable remediation, the standard, I'm not sure. I, Being sort of led by an international committee, uh, I'm not sure whether, you know, regulators around the world were actually involved at any stage. And if you're talking about the standards that apply to PFAS, then yes, the state regulators will have been involved in the NEPM and the NEMP, uh, of course. So the difference between the NEMP and the NEPM, just for me? <laughs> uh, the NEPM we're all familiar with, sort of the overarching documents on land contamination. The NEMP... Um, I've been around for a while, and when I started off, there were NMPs, not NEMPs, and there were NMPs for dioxins and furans, 
PCBs, OCPs, and HCB applying only to the Orica botany site. So I see the PFAS NEMP as sort of the fifth or sixth NMP, National Management Plan, but somebody thought it was appropriate to put the word environment into the title this time. Uh, so it's a plan that applies specifically to PFAS, whereas the NEPM uh, it, it sort of applies across the board and deals with you know, lists of chemicals. Thanks for that. Well, we've got a lot of questions coming through in the Q&A. We've got to charge on to that. Um, Ooh. Malcolm Barker. Thanks for the presentation. What can be done when the PFAS is already well off the site of initiation in the groundwater? Well, you, you'd need to look at the context. You need to understand, you need to do your risk assessment on the groundwater pathway and you know, where it's going to and what receptors it's affecting to determine what the real risk is and whether you should or shouldn't take action. Um, obviously, if it's a situation where you've got high concentrations and you've got sensitive down gradient receptors, you can apply the usual groundwater uh, remediation strategies from containment down to pump and treat and that sort of thing. And hopefully there'll be some more innovative um, solutions coming there with you know injection of nanoparticles and things to you know lock plumes up etc cetera, etc cetera. i would point out that for most sites i've seen and i think most sites that everyone's seen groundwater is not the main pathway for pfas and not the main risk for pfas it's actually the surface water pathway Okay, there's a question from Ken Gilbert about are the mass buckets based on thresholds? Uh, well, the, the concentration classes I was dealing with um, were, were um, I guess, classes of convenience, uh, not necessarily of risk. The top one, the greater than 50, is related to the NEMP. Um, and that greater than 50 appears in the other national management plans for OCPs and PCBs and HCB. Um, below that, they were simply classes of convenience for the hypothetical. And the hypothetical is sort of based on multiple sites. And, and that sort of formula works where you've got high concentrations, i.e. greater than 50, down to low concentrations. If your site went from 10 milligrams a kilogram down to 0 0.01, whatever, and then you might subdivide it into other classes. If you're using 3D models to actually develop uh, sort of an understanding of how the mass is distributed, you can interrogate those models by whatever class increments you want to discover how the mass is distributed. Um, but with 3D models, there's a lot to be known about how to apply them, of course. And if your data going in isn't good, then the answer coming out won't be good either. You mentioned that there's a they tend to overestimate the mass. So. Uh, yeah, this this was working uh, with with the EVS model, um, which does apply uh, certain confidence intervals. You can actually calculate confidence intervals. Some models don't do that. They just sort of deal with the most likely case or the 50% confidence interval. You know, the 50%, uh, the value may be higher or it may be lower with equal confidence. Um, what we found with the EVS model was you needed to use higher confidence intervals to better define the hot spots. But if, if you applied the same higher confidence interval to the low concentrations, then you tended to overestimate what was in them. And when you look at those cumulative plots I had there, from 0 0.1 to 1, there are nine decimal points, but there was 40% of the mass. So that's 3 to 4% per decimal point. But from 1 to 150, there's 150 milligrams a kilogram and there's 40% of the mass. So that's only 
half a percent per milligram per kilogram. Um, and the sensitivity of not, you know, nine decimal points having 40% of the mass, it, it tells you, you if you make a small error in selecting the concentration in that low concentration zone, you're gonna have a big impact on the amount of mass you calculate. If you make the same error for the rest, you won't. Uh, it's just a, a mathematical artifact. So I, I get very suspicious. So I, you've got to be very um, questioning when you see model outcomes, I guess. Make sure they make sense. So presumably you give a range when you're doing these sorts of things based on those different estimates of, from the confidence that you have. Yeah, it, it will be site specific. It depend on what range of concentrations you're dealing with in the first place. Okay. All right, next question from Ron Blankenforth. I think the question is, Ari Hemp, can you use hemp to remediate PFAS in soils? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ron likes hemp. And where does the PFAS in soil come from? Where does it come from? Uh, it's totally man-made to start off with. So somebody put it there. Usually it comes from firefighting training on, on airport sites. So it's the phone. And lots of other industrial sites. Um, you'd be surprised the number of people I've spoken to uh, in my mentoring role, <laughs> younger scientists who tell me, oh, yeah, we used to go to Christmas parties at the such and such a site and they'd foam it up for us to play in the foam. <laughs> I'm just surprised by the number of people who can tell me that. Didn't happen to me when I was a kid. Uh, next question from Malcolm Barker. Leaving the low-level PFAS means you are leaving a risk. When is that acceptable as far as concentration? Mm -hmm. Well, once again, that would be site-specific and you'd have to do a risk assessment. But at the end of the day, it's also a practicability issue because you know, if we don't have the financial resources to address that low-level concentration, um the risk will remain and we may have to find other ways to deal with it uh you know there are people looking at um given that the risk will be it gets mobilized into surface water the question is can we actually trap it in the surface water and there are people looking at all sorts of innovative ways to you know put funnel and gates in the streams or carbon beds in the streams or carbon coated pebbles in the streams that will take the PFAS out. The problem is <clears throat> the flow regimes are very peaky in surface waters, of course. You'll get very large flows in very short periods of time and designing treatment processes to actually try and capture the flux is extremely difficult. Better to try and address the source, but it's not going to be done everywhere. We just don't have the resources nationally to do it. Yeah. So it seems it's more about take as much out as you can afford to do, but there'll be this residual in most instances. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where this proportionality thing comes in. If you can remove 90% of the mass, well, that's a great thing to do. Um, number one, let's get rid of 90% of the mass and then stress about the 10% that's left. But, you know, let's get the 90% out to start off with. Uh, I, I'm reminded, in fact, I've been around for long enough. I, I used the Dutch guidelines back in the 90s. <laughs> and the Dutch guidelines were sort of clean up everything everywhere to nothing. Now, in the noughties, the Dutch suddenly realised they were spending lots of money and they went and surveyed the hot. They took a pause and they took five years and surveyed all of the rest of the problems in, in the Netherlands, environmental problems, and they figured out they would bankrupt themselves, you know, a thousand times over in the next hundred years if they kept going with the Dutch guidelines. So they, in fact, adopted a totally different remediation strategy and they created sort of regions of contamination. Instead of having everyone fighting with lawyers about who did what, they forced them all into groupings to address uh, contamination in regions. And they did innovative things like um, pumping groundwater for heat um, heating and doing remediation of the water on the way through. and and totally changed their strategy. But the bottom line was they didn't have the resources to do what their regulations said they should be doing. So that's a very the financial 
issue is very important. And like I say, we start at the top and stop when you run out of money. I mean, just as a general comment, you know, we used to do a lot of sort of environmental management plans which had a long-term monitoring component to them. And I'm not sure if they were ever really implemented properly. Like it's always been the weak point, you know, once something's been built. I suppose that's just a, another pondering. Uh, next no. one from Laura Tan. Do you also monitor and manage cumulative concentrations of PFAS at receptors that have been transported via surface water? Um, it's kind of outside my area of expertise, but I know the risk assessors will actually be doing out, uh, be doing biota sampling and that sort of thing, um, particularly for surface water systems where you've got um, you know birds and fish and mammals involved so yes it does happen and it has a place um, i'm sure it's a very important um, field of endeavor in its own right well it's part of risk assessment there was a pretty good uh, presentation at one of the alga eco forums <laughs> up in newcastle where they had a study of the pfas build up in turtles that they were looking at mm. That was pretty dramatic in terms of the impacts on, I think, on the hardness of the eggs. All right, next question. James Stewart. James from Always Carbon. Super presentation and very interesting information. There you go. Can biochar be used to capture and immobilise PFAS? Is it being done in Australia yet? Uh, well, we... We know that PFAS binds to carbon, so yes, I'm sure you can use biochar, but that's not the question I'd be asking. I'd be asking what's the efficiency of the capture? Um, and this is something I'm not going to tell you the answer to <laughs> in any detail. We've got to go to the symposium next week to find this out, and there's some really interesting stuff around on this. Um, do some Googling. Uh, try biochar, pack, US Forestry Service. And that's as much clue as I'm going to give you. Andy hints. Next one. Understand, this is from Laura Tan again. Understanding of PFAS impact on flora in the Pilbara is limited and therefore it is difficult to risk assess. Are you aware of any research being done in this space? Uh, well, there is certainly research being done on PFAS and vegetation. Um, the Pilbara I don't know about and risk assessment, assessment isn't my forte, but I would suggest that what's happening and the latest developments will be discussed at the symposium next week by risk assessors. Malcolm Barker, how do you have ongoing evaluation of the PFAS as you excavate and dispose of material for every load? Good question. Well, there's a couple of schools of thought on this, and it depends a bit on time and space um, and budget. You can dig up, uh, number one, you will have a, a good idea what's where once you've done your site assessment. And you can actually proceed by digging the stockpiles and testing stockpiles appropriately and classifying them, and then doing whatever you need to do, depending on how they classify. The second school of thought, which... Um, uh, is also occurring is basically to do in situ classification. So collect your assessment data at the density that you would be collecting it if you were doing classification in stockpile, which means you've got to get a lot more assessment data um, classified in situ and then dig it straight to a truck and take it to work treatment or to landfill or to immobilisation and reuse. Um, and putting that extra time and effort in up front will speed up your field programs if time is a critical element. Um, and the EPAs, to my knowledge, several, I'm not aware of any EPA that hasn't, that has rejected that approach, providing the assessment data is at the correct density for um, waste classification according to whatever the state guidelines are. What bulking factor do you use for that, John, when you go from in situ to 
stockpile. Sorry, what? What bulking factor would you apply? So, like, does it change? Oh, I'm not, uh, I can't remember bulking factors off the top of my head, but the projects I worked on where we did in situ, we did back calculate, you know, how many cubic metres in the ground equaled how many cubic metres in the stockpile. Because I think the regulations, I'm not sure whether the regulations talk about in stockpile or in, in situ cubic metres when they specify rates. Um, in remediation, we always work from in situ cubic metres. That's the basic unit of measurement and everything else um, stems from that. Usually it's in situ metres and tonnes because in situ metres can be surveyed and tonnes can be weighed. Once you put it into a stockpile, it becomes um, uh, less, the measurements are less certain, I think. So 1.6 comes to mind. Right, as, a, as a bulking factor. Um, should mass reduction, this is from Ken Gilbert, should mass reduction be based on leachable limits rather than soil concentrations? Uh, it could be. Um, I actually did, um, this hypothetical was a site with PFOS plus PFHXS on it, and I've done quite a lot of... Um, correlation between leachability and concentration for those sorts of chemicals, which are typical of some of the firefighting sites, and there's a very good correlation. So it's simpler to work with the concentration data, but you do need to you know, have a database of, of ASLPs or TCLPs if you're in New South Wales for waste classification purposes. Okay. Um, we've got about 12 questions to go. Are you happy to keep going for another 15 minutes, John? Sure. Thanks for that. Uh, let me just have a, a sip of cold tea. Okay. Excuse my mug. Excellent. Okay. This is from Christy Hansen. Good question, Richard, about the risk. Once one could argue that the associated risk doesn't change much across all these options, just playing devil's advocate. Mm, what do you think of that, John? Maybe don't pull any of it out. Oh, I, I'm interpreting that question to mean the risk between immobilised and thermally treated, um, whether the risks are the same. Um, which is always the question, you know, how good is the immobilisation? How long will it last? Because if you can immobilise it, um, do you need to go the extra yard and thermally treat it? Um, using high-grade packs, and I'm not going to define what high-grade packs are, but um, we were seeing 9999 percent reduction in leachability which is a pretty significant reduction and um, it's kind of equivalent to getting 99.9999 percent destruction in a thermal plant uh, you know what's left is pretty small the question is how long will it last um, there's a lot of research going on in this area at the moment with you know accelerated leachabilities and all sorts of things and there are two questions one is how long will the carbon last and the second is, um, how long will the adsorption last? Now, the carbon is interesting in that um, there's been a bit of research in the last decade on agriculturally improved soils in South America that date back thousands of years. So the Inca and Aztec, where they used charcoal uh, as an additive to soil, and you can still identify those uh, agricultural areas today from the charcoal content. And I think the latest I heard was that uh, the researchers have come to a similar conclusion in terms of the longevity of the activated carbon. Um, having said that, pack vessels are known for taking up oxygen and having oxygen deficient um, atmospheres and also spontaneous combustion. So the, the, the carbon must be reacting with atmospheric oxygen and um, 
you know, degrading slowly over time, but it looks like the carbon is lasting thousands of years. The second question is how long will the PFAS stay absorbed? And CSIRO has been doing some longitudinal studies with some samples that were immobilised a decade ago or more and left in a warehouse, and now they've been pulled out and they're being reanalysed. Uh, I think it's part of a, a defence project, and I think they've published uh, the second round of um, longitudinal study was published, or the preprints came out just recently. And some of the packs... Uh, uh, are performing over time and some of them aren't. Um, so there's a lot more to be discovered there, but it's looking promising that immobilisation will you know, have a similar outcome. Obviously not the same as thermal treatment, but uh, I'll be retired finally by the time the answer to that one comes up, of course. Well, that's good to raise that. That's a nice segue into the next one. What made you want to come back from retirement? Well, I never really retired. I just semi-retired. Um, and um, I find it fun. Um, it's it's still, still very interesting and stimulating. And uh, I get to talk to people younger than myself. <laughs> <laughs> and and maybe maybe I've got something to contribute as well. So pick my brains while you can. Okay, Chris, uh, not a question, but Scott Carroll's got a comment that ADE have a mobile PFAS analyzer. Might follow you up on that, Scott. Let's see if it's something Hydro Terra should get. I believe this to be quite accurate, backed up by additional lab testing for peace of mind. Well, that's a good development then. Uh, Brent Davey, g'day, Brent. I don't think PFAS are regarded as being susceptible to bioremediation or biological breakdown in any event. Uh, that's also my understanding. There, there is some biotransformation goes on, but not bioremediation. However, there are people um, trying bioremediation to um, see if they can crack it. Okay, Scott Carroll has a question. Is there a best way to schedule the program of works for a project so that it maximises the potential for sustainable outcomes? Uh, yes, uh, and it's not to send me the request two weeks before Christmas. Uh, it, but, you know, seriously... Um, if you run out of if if you run out of time, if you don't uh, do the work up front and you come in in a rush, you're not going to get the best solution. It's always better to have a very holistic approach to these things. Identify the problem properly, and um, that way you'll develop the right solution. All of that takes time and money up front, um, so it'll just be depend on the circumstances of the site owners as to whether you do or, or don't get the advantage of having time to plan the best solution. Okay, an anonymous attendee. Do you find that EPA and regulations to be mostly helpful or mostly in the way of remediation? Uh, oh, that's a tricky one. Because <laughs> when I started, there were virtually no regulations. <laughs> we just did what we feel like. No, we didn't. We, we followed regulations from other countries. Um, I think the the current generation of PFAS regulations are really, really good, actually. They, they do allow flexibility um, and, and, you know, they do allow innovation. The only complaint I would have is the time it takes to get them in place, and that's just a function of the process of getting everyone to agree, of course, and uh, getting all the technical people to put all the technical stuff together for consideration in the first place. It's, the process is unwieldy, but I think the results are very good. I think we've already answered the next question from Ron Blankenforth. So the Luke Munix, hi, John. Have you any examples where the social aspect 
in ESG has been considered in detail? Uh, yeah, um, not necessarily for, the, for PFAS. Um, the social dimension is always site specific as well. Um, you know, you don't need to overcook it if it doesn't need to be overcooked. But I've worked on projects that have had, you know, a year or, or more of consultation before anything happened. And then they've had regular consultation through five to 10 years of work. I'm thinking of the, the uh, roads remediation so dioxins and thermal plants and that sort of thing. Um, Orica Botany, of course, the Orica projects have all had very long ongoing community consultation that's been very well done uh, as well. Um, I've worked on projects where the community meetings, maybe two or three people turned up um, and, you know, some of the sites, um, Kendall Bay, for instance, um, Germany did, did such a good job on the consultation that by the time it came to the project, people literally weren't interested anymore. They, they'd found out everything they needed to know and it sort of became a non-issue. Um, and then other projects that are very small, they might just be door knocks and, you know, they're not going to impact people. So you don't need to do the whole hog on consultation. All right. Um... Next question. Where do you think the future of PFAS management within the regulatory space is headed? Uh, I think, as I said before, it's fairly early days and I view the regulations as very precautionary. They're set at very low levels because we, we really don't know the answers and you don't, you can't be setting, you know, high levels um, if you don't know that uh, they're acceptable. So I'm expecting as the science matures that the regulations will move and possibly the concentrations will, will come up. I, I know that there are some areas where numbers will change and become less conservative simply because, you know, the research has been done and the answers have changed, uh, changed views. But once again, the process of getting those changes into the regulations is fairly unwieldy. Okay, second last question. Alex Liminager, what is your opinion on activated carbon for PFAS remediation, considering PFAS is only absorbed, not destroyed in this case? Yeah, we're, we've touched on that um, several times already and it comes down to that discussion of how long will the carbon last and how long will the absorption last. Um, at the moment, uh, as I said, the carbon looks like it is fairly long-lasting. Um, absorption's different. Uh, you know, if the fluid's moving through the, uh, the carbon that's got absorbed PFAS, if the composition of the fluids change or the pH changes, you could see desorption. Uh, so that's a complication. It's always going to be an area where there's some uncertainty and some monitoring required. And I would observe in other areas like landfills and landfill liners, they all have design lives. Um, and at the end of their design lives, which are usually in decades, um, they fail and the remediation needs to be redone. Now, what the design life is of carbon I'm just not sure. I don't think anyone knows, but it's subject to ongoing research. But a good question. Final question from Emmy Lou Cook. Is there opportunity to include the value of ecosystem services within the sustainability assessment? For example, loss of these associated with disposal of soil to landfill. Mm, say that one again. Opportunity to. Uh, is there opportunity to include the value of ecosystem services within the sustainability assessment? For example, loss of these associated with disposal of soil to landfill. So in terms of the assessment framework you're using, and looking at the various options, is there an assessment of potential impact of ecosystem between those? 
Um, I, I'd say there is, but um, the concept of ecosystem services, et cetera, needs to be socialised uh, perhaps in the regulatory community and the remediation community. Um, I'd like to talk to Emmy Lou about that one off, uh, offline. All right. Well, sounds like we left the trickiest question to last. Mm. So that brings us to an end, John, and thank you very much for your contribution today. It was fantastic, and uh, many thanks to everyone who attended as well. But uh, thanks very much, John. appreciate it. Thanks, Richard, for the opportunity, and thank you all for uh, listening. Hope you learned something. <laughs>